feature program today on Bush Telegraph. I'm Cameron Wilson, you're on RN and Radio Australia. This morning we explore Australia's ancient agricultural past and we ask the question, have the complex land management systems of Indigenous Australians been overlooked for generations? We'll take you travelling around the country to hear from people who believe that the hunter-gatherer tag is based on a false premise and they argue that to fully understand how to manage this continent, we must first recognise our past. Stay with us. That's today on Bush Telegraph. Recently a book was published, it was authored by Bruce Pascoe and it was called Dark Emu, Black Seeds, Agriculture or Accident and it questions what we believe, what we know about how the landscape was managed here in Australia. It challenges, if you like, the white history of our past. Bruce argues that the economy and culture of the first Australians has been grossly undervalued and we need to rethink Indigenous agriculture. Hi Bruce, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Uh, Bill Gamage is also with me. You might know Bill, he's a historian at the ANU and he also believes the complexities of Indigenous land management pre-white settlement has been overlooked by historians. Bill is the author of The Biggest Estate on Earth, How Aborigines Made Australia. Bill, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Good day, Cameron. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Bruce, let's start with you. Why do you believe our notion that Indigenous Australians were simply hunter-gatherers is a false one? Well, I think the evidence is in the explorers' journals. What they first saw when they entered the country uh, wasn't hunter and gathering uh, so much as um, a form of agriculture. Um, Mitchell saw nine miles of grain being grown, a monoculture, um, and the grain had been cut and stooped. Uh, Gregory actually saw it being irrigated. These aren't the activities of uh, hunters and gatherers. Why do you agree? Yeah, uh, uh, Bruce's book has got uh, evidence from all over Australia, thousands of quotes, and quite clearly observant early travellers, uh, notably the explorers, uh, saw uh, and recorded evidence of agriculture, not only with grain, but with uh, tubers and uh, aquaculture. Um, I think the evidence is uh, uh, so overwhelming that the surprise is not that I'd agree, but that uh, people haven't dropped to this before. Bruce, how how widely used were these complex systems you describe? Are we, are we talking all across the continent? We are. The entire continent was used. In fact, in, in Sturt's stony desert, uh, when Charles Sturt first went there, uh, on the barren banks of the Warburton River, people were using uh, the river bed uh, as a grain growing district and uh, saved his life by uh, providing him with water and uh, roast duck and cakes that the cakes had been made from that grain. Uh, the most inhospitable part of Australia and uh, Aboriginal people were running an agricultural society. I've, I had a chat uh, before the program today with Uncle Max Harrison who's a, a senior lawman from the south coast of, of New South Wales and uh, I spoke to him about what he remembers being told as a, as a child in the middle of, of last century. Some of us young, what, young, young fellows would go and over fishing somewhere, you know, some of the uncles and aunties would sing out, where are you going? Oh, we're going out we are, you know, fishing for, you know, a drummer or whatever it was, you know, and they say, well, look, while you're over there, you know, there's a, uh, in that area, at this particular place, you know, you, you, you go about four or five crevices away and you get the, and you get the mutton fish out of there, so you call that the line mutton fish. So we'd, uh, we knew where we had to go and get it, and you know, and, and there could be plenty more, plenty more abalone elsewhere, but uh, we were directed where to get it, you know, so we'd, we'd do it. Were there some places yeah. you weren't allowed to go? Well, there was, yeah, but 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 uh, uh, but you don't muck the system up, see? What do you mean by you don't muck the system up? Well, it's like it's like if you're gonna, uh, it, it's collecting berries and and, and 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 fruits and that. If you walk along and you see that, you see the the, the berries and fruits and that, you know, you 
shake the plant or the vines or the or the tree three times. And if, if the fruit and the berries fall off, it's yours. If it doesn't, then it's not yours. You know. And then you take you take what has fallen down. So so you never pluck them off. And that and that was the same as the, how they used to uh, have that system of gathering the the, the abalone or the mutton fish. You know. They would take some out of there, and uh, and then they wouldn't, uh, and they would uh, move to another area. You know, not just the next, not just the next crevice, but one, you know, further away somewhere. So you always kept the, you always kept the food in the in the in the in the appropriate places. See, it was, it's just like when you're walking into a supermarket. You're walking in, you're looking up to see the name of the food that you're going to get, you know. And then you walk down and just those, those aisles are all the way have got food in it. Well, that's the same system that the old fellas used in, in, in hunting and gathering, you know. Same system. That's Uncle Max Harrison, <laughs> senior old man from the south coast of New South Wales. We'll hear more from Uncle Max uh, a little later. Bruce Pascoe, since writing this book, have you had... Indigenous people, more Indigenous people come forward and, and tell you what they were told when they were growing up? Yeah, that's the great thing about it, um, is that the majority of the people who have uh, written to me uh, about Dark Emu have been Aboriginal people and uh, telling me about their days in Western New South Wales, where they remember the old people uh, harvesting grain in their lifetime. So uh, it was great to hear those stories. And they just back up um, all the stories that I use in the, in the book that come directly uh, from the explorers. And they come from every corner um, of Australia. But what Uncle Max was saying, and Uncle Max is a teacher of mine, um, it, there was more government how the land was to be used and how the provision of the land uh, was to be allocated. But how many of the stories would be stories of actual farming uh, rather than just stories of, of gathering? Well, uh, the, the gathering stories have taken over somewhat from the farming stories because gathering was all that was left to people uh, once the land was taken away. You couldn't do broad acre agricultural activities uh, once the land had been taken from you. So you were um, eventually gathering. But if you read, read the explorer's journals, you can see that the, the preponderance of the economic activity was large scale and involved um, cultivation. Around Melbourne, for instance, um, uh, Beatty saw that the hills had been uh, contoured uh, during the process of digging up yam daisy. Uh, this was a, a dramatic uh, alteration of the landscape to make use of uh, the yam daisy plant. Well, you've drawn on um, journals and, and writings by early European white explorers and surveyors in, in your work as well, and the biggest to say it on Earth. Why, why is it important to draw on the, the white documents of, of history rather than just the oral traditions of Indigenous Australians? Well, can I say first that, uh, that I think the uh, skill in which Aboriginal people gathered uh, food and resources is very well known. The key key point is that they actually organise the landscape so as to make those uh, resources predictable. It wasn't a matter of just harvesting grain. As uh, Bruce said earlier, uh, Mitchell's on the uh, Narran River and he says, we rode nine miles through this grass only and as far back as the eye could see. This grass only, that's clearly a crop. There are no weeds and no other, other plants. In other words, it's been organised so that uh, the gathering is really the end point of a very sophisticated farming process. And the reason for going back to the earliest possible records is uh, firstly to show how widespread and how diverse these farming practices are, and secondly to make sure or to guard against the possibility that some readers might think that uh, Aboriginal farming was influenced by the Europeans. So if you have later records, then people might say, oh, it 
they learnt that from the Europeans, whereas with the very early records, it's impossible to be anyone but Aboriginal people. Since you've, you've brought up Major Mitchell, let's hear an excerpt from Bruce's book, Dark Emu. This is um, Explorer and Surveyor Major Thomas Mitchell describing the land around Belyanda River, that's in central Queensland, and this is a description from back, from back in 1848. We crossed some patches of dry swamp where the clods had been extensively turned up by the natives. These clods were so very large and hard that we were obliged to throw them aside and clear the way for our carts to pass. The hole resembled ground broken with the hoe. There might be about two acres in the patch we crossed and we perceived at a distance other portions of the ground in a similar state. So there's a, an excerpt from um, Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu. Bill, you've also drawn on European artworks in the past as well to support your argument. What do, what do European artworks tell you about the management of the landscape? Well, I think they're wonderful evidence. Uh, first of all, you have to overcome uh, prejudice among <coughs> art specialists that uh, these paintings are romanticised landscapes. Uh, and you can do that by going to the site and comparing then and now, and you can see how accurately uh, the landscapes were depicted. The other advantage of them is that the artists are uh, observing what Aboriginal people are doing without realising really uh, what they're up to. And so they're quite unconsciously, not deliberately or not with prejudice, uh, depicting Aboriginal farming and uh, land management activities. And for that reason, uh, they're extremely valuable. And of course, uh, what you can see convinces people. It's very convincing evidence. But why are you so sure there is no prejudice in the artwork? Because that is the, the argument you hear, isn't it? That the European painters in particular were, were influenced by their European upbringing and, and that seeped into their work. <laughs> well, there's less prejudice of that kind than there was. And of course, there are some highly romanticised uh, uh, Australian art paintings. But you can check uh, then and now and uh, see that that claim, so commonly made, is simply not true. Indeed, it's not true of, uh, of the UK, where this movement's supposed to have uh, come from. People can go to where John Constable painted landscapes, for example, and match then and now, and the same thing was going on in Australia. I mean, if you're a squatter, wealthy man, you hire a painter to paint your landscape, and he gets it wrong, you're going to tell him, and you might not pay him. So obviously, you people are going to go to the trouble of painting the land accurately, and the people accurately. Uh, Bruce Pascoe, how important do you think um, European artwork, early settler artwork, is to, um, to telling the story of the, the complexities of, of Indigenous land management and agriculture? Well, I was uh, impressed with uh, Bill's book, uh, how it refers to the, the, those paintings and going to the sites and recognising rocks and individual trees that are still there to show that um, the landscape was a managed landscape because when I went to school uh, I'd been told that the English painters simply came out here with English technique and couldn't paint the Australian bush because what they painted was open and grassy and uh, like an English park and Australian art teachers in my era were telling us this couldn't have been so because now we've got a lot of scrub and large forest. But that wasn't what it was like. So these paintings are actually important documents. But if the, the landscape was open and, open and grassy rather than the bush we think of today, what does that actually tell you? Or how does that inform you about the land practices that were going on? Well, uh, when Mitchell came across Australia Felix, he uh, climbed a, a small hill and looked to his west, and the entire plain was covered in yellow. And he called it herbs. But in fact, it was Microceris lanceolata. It was the yam daisy. The entire field was covered in a monoculture of yam daisy. And he saw Aboriginal people harvesting the yam. This is a massive enterprise. And so we, we have to use those paintings to verify the fact that what Mitchell said he saw, he actually did see. You listen to Bush Telegraph. With me is Bruce Pascoe, who's the author of a relatively new book called Dark Emu, Black Seeds, Agriculture or Accident. And I'm also um, with Bill Gamage, who's a historian and the author of The Biggest Estate on Earth, How Aborigines Made Australia. And we're, we're challenging the premise today that 
Aboriginal Australians were hunter-gatherers and suggesting that perhaps there was much more intricate land management and cultivation and trading as well of food that, uh, that went on. We've got uh, lots of examples to, to go through uh, during the program today, but I want to get a little bit more of a, an insight into Indigenous plants and their uses. So in order to get that, I went and visited Beth Gott. Now, Beth is an adjunct research fellow at the Department of Biological Sciences at Monash University, and she developed the Aboriginal garden there. So I paid her a visit to m learn more about the garden and the plants in it. This garden contains not just food plants. It contains plants that were used for any sort uh, of function. It uh, particularly uh, plants that were used for medicine or the plants that were used for fibre or plants that were um, used for fruits or the underground roots uh, which in the Melbourne area uh, where underground plant storage routes were more important uh, for food than say in Central Australia where grains from grasses are much more used. Well, can we go for a bit of a wander, Beth, and have um, a look at some of the plants, and maybe if you could explain for us what, what some of them are used for. This is burrowing, and it's a, a plant which looks like a palm, but is actually related to the conifers, the, and, and they, they uh, have male and female cones, and um, there are, when the female cone is ripe, it's big, and has a seed in it like um, a very big pine nut. Cooks very well, but it has to be, this particular one has to be pounded up and washed to get the, uh, the plants that are, um, the, the parts of the plant, that, which is like a pine nut, as I said, mm. but it has to be washed to get the, to the things out that don't agree with one's diet. The burrowing is managed by the use of fire as fire was one of the most important tools in the management of plants. Beth, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple of plants. Bootlace bush, for, in, for instance, um, mm -hmm. what was it used for? Oh, bootlace bush, is, it's one of the um, pimelias and it's a plant which has a very tough and strippable bark and so it because it's so tough if you break a, a boot lace you can use this as, a, as, as a, a substitute and that's why it's called it's become to be called boot lace bush but the boot lace bush what would it actually the, the fiber what would that have been used for oh it would be well for fiber fiber is very important for people who are uh, walking uh, over the country. First of all, you need <laughs> baskets to carry things in. You need to bind uh, stone axes to a handle. And each fibre plant, because they all have <coughs> fibre in different forms, will be used for different for different things. Uh, you uh, you might use fibre for making a basket and, and another plant you might use just for tying things up. And I can show you one over here that is used for tying things up. This is called the flax lily. The flax lily we have found in, uh, in conjunction with a, a bone burial in central Victoria and there was a bag into which the bones were put and the bag was tied at the top with this plant. The flax lilies, you notice that all you need to do is to run your fingernail along there and you can get it in two pieces and you then just twist that into a two-ply, well, it's just two-ply twine really mm. and it's very, very strong and there are Flex lilies are, are quite common. Uh, there are some plants that we use, we can use easily because these are nice and smooth to work with. But we, you would have, even though a plant was good for fibre, you might avoid it if when you run your finger along it, 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 it cuts. So that, the flex lily there used for, 
for making bags, weaving bags, that sort of thing? Yes. Well, it, it, it was used for, for that, used at the time, making a string to tie things up, and it's, we actually found the bag with the bones in it tied up with this. Of course, it was, at that stage, very dry, but by soaking it in water, we could recover the anatomy of the of the plant and realise that, by comparison, it was this particular plant that was used. What uh, about the bones? No. Huh? What did the bones belong to? Oh, the bones belonged to, to probably a valued person. They were... Human uh, bones? Yes. People would often carry bones around in a, in a little bag if they belonged to someone who was who was valued and it was if I can remember rightly it was uh, uh, the bones of a young woman and those bones were treasured they were put into a little niche in a, a little dry niche in a, 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 a stony cliff area there in that dry beautifully dry spot people had put the bones of someone they cherished and, and they had put the bones in, in a bag which was made from the inner stem of, uh, inner bark of a wattle and um, then was tied up with the flax lily. Beth Gossett, the Aboriginal gardener at Monash University in Melbourne. Beth's adjunct research fellow at the Department of Biological Sciences. There, Bill Gummidge is still with me. Bill, Bill Beth referred to the, the use of fire to manipulate Plants. How complex was the was fire used? How complex was the use of fire? Let me say first, uh, Beth is a national treasure. You know, her, her evidence is, makes so clear that uh, um, how how carefully Aboriginal people looked after plants. Um, and she mentioned the burrowing. That's an example of a plant that's cultivated with fire. It needs fire to, to flourish, and there are many other. Uh, plants, uh, uh, hakeas, callistamins, uh, um, so uh, who, who need uh, for, which need fire to flourish. But as well as that, Aboriginal people use fire to distribute plant communities like grass or open forest uh, across the country. And the reason for doing that was to associate food for animals with shelter for animals. Uh, the most common example is uh, you create grass, which is uh, food for grazing animals like kangaroos. You put next to it an open forest, which is their shelter. That encourages the kangaroos or the grazers to come from the shelter onto the grass. And then you burn the grass, and a fortnight later you get this sweet, fresh growth. That lures the kangaroos to that particular spot, and then they can be... First of all, that makes them abundant, because they've got plenty of good tucker, and they can be harvested more easily. So an extremely c complicated uh, fire management system, absolutely crucial to Aboriginal uh, land maintenance, and again, across the whole of Australia, including Tasmania. The, uh, I wonder if the uh, complexities are underappreciated amongst many as well. My guest on Bush Telegraph, uh, Bill Gamage, who's a historian and the author of The Biggest Estate on Earth, How Aborigines Made Australia, and also author Bruce Pascoe, whose new book is Dark Emu, Black Seeds, Agriculture or Accident. You're listening to, to Bush Telegraph. Well, Bruce and Bill, it wasn't just agriculture and the use of plants where Indigenous Australians use their ingenuity, there's still evidence of the extensive aquaculture and fishing systems. Now you both mentioned in your books the fish traps at Brewarrina in New South Wales and the eel traps at Lake Condor in the Western District of Victoria. A couple of people with extensive knowledge of the, the significance of Lake Condor are Heather Bilt, an archaeologist whose work in the 1990s on the site is still considered groundbreaking today, and also Jimmy Onus, whose grandfather told him how the eel traps were used. Welcome to, to both of you. It's nice to have you on the program. Uh, Jimmy, what do you remember being told by your grandfather? Well, I remember that uh, he told us that we used we used to get the eels and uh, how important they were to our, our diet and our way of living. And we use it for various things. It wasn't just uh, food. We also use the oil for uh, to keep them warm and to keep uh, even to keep insects away. And 
things like that as well, yeah. H how did you catch them? We caught them... We had a... Uh, we had some fish traps that, were, that had been built a long, long time ago by our ancestors. And they would... In the old days, they'd put these... Uh, these nets, these nets at the end of them, and they would catch the eels like that. Heather, but what remains of the, the traps today? What remains is the um, non-organic foundations that form the structure of the whole system. And because it was built on a across a lava flow, it was beautiful because there was the material available to actually get your structure there. And because it was rock hard lava, it wasn't possible to, to do it without the rocks as your basis for your foundation, whether it was the, the little dwellings or the fish trap systems themselves. They couldn't go into the earth because the earth stopped very quickly. So the rock was used just as building material, and it's there to this day because it was non-organic. It's still there, and that gave the whole story away. Dwellings, yes. Were there dwellings as well as the traps? Well, it, this was a marvellous system of, um, I'm talking about the Mount Eccles lava flow now, at least I've mapped 100 square kilometres of man-made, <coughs> cultural, managed, constructed, modified land, which ended up, resulted in a network of channels and connected wetlands, the wetlands themselves, um, all in a mosaic, but they were not natural. The wetlands had been dammed up to ensure that the water stayed in them in times of a uh, dry drought, which happened in the last 4,000 years. So um, around these wetlands, the, the little houses and storage areas were positioned, and they could be right up to two metres from the edge of a wetland because the nature of the lava flow meant that the land was well drained. It didn't get boggy. You were either in the water or you were on dry land, and um, it was the perfect conditions along with the migrating eel, short fin eel, for a whole community network, whatever you want to call it, to, to develop, a whole society to develop. But like a, a fishing village? Yes, but there were many villages. There were, I think, I don't know, thousands of people were kept very well and they were able to be permanently living there and because of the wetland, um, the water bodies, it meant that you could grow aquatic plants, and I say grow because the, the people could live permanently. I'll call a halt to part one here.